29 from the University of, of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. Janelle is a parishioner of the Cathedral Church of the Holy Trinity and is involved in numerous organizations, including the Lions Club of Port of Spain, North. Her interests and research areas include the Anglican Church in the Caribbean, family genealogies, and the history and records of the sugar industry in Trinidad and Tobago. I know we are waiting to hear the discourse between Janelle Duke and Dr. Heather Cato. So I hand over now to Janelle. Right. Good evening, everyone. And thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Wendy, for your introduction. I'm always excited to talk about the history of the Anglican Church. And as you heard, one of my interests is definitely analyzing the records that the church has produced since the first, its first appearance in 1801. So within these records lay a host of subject matter that vary from, but not isolated to, national identity, national memory, uh, social, economic, and political themes. And we as historians, archivists, parishioners, and the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, we are yet to explore all of these themes. So this evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce such a distinguished historian. And as a student of history at St. Augustine, as a rule, you had to do the history of the West Indies, part one and part two. And over the year, Dr. Cato's passion for history was always that driving force for us to excel. So let me just give you a little bit about Dr. Cato. She is a senior lecturer in Caribbean history at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus and the current Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. She has held the positions of head of the history department and the university dean. Her research focus has led to the, the revisionary approach to plantation and enslavement systems in the Caribbean. So before I go into and hand over to Dr. Cato, I have a few house rules. So our speaker would have 20 to 25 minutes of presentation time. When there is five minutes left, you would hear a sound so that you know that there's five minutes. Any questions that you may have, I would like to invite you to share them in our question and answer segment. You can use either the chat box function on Zoom, or if you would like to ask your questions directly, you can use the raise hand function at the bottom of the screen so that, you can, that I can get to you as quickly as possible. I hope that these are not too many rules. So without further ado, Dr. Cato, I now hand over to you. Good night, everyone. Let me say thank you, Janelle. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to start by saying simply happy independence to the entire group. As we celebrate 59 years of independence, I, I can't help but think that we are fast approaching 60. And for me, this is a very significant milestone. 60 years of independence. We growing up, we getting big. The Anglican Church can be said to have been present in almost every major development in our country's history. This discussion is therefore extremely timely. It is a good time. It is a good time to think about how we've gotten to this point. It is a good time to understand the lessons that can be learned from our history. It is a good time to charge a course for this 21st century that has already showed us clearly that it is going to be a force to reckon with. I will start with confessions. I was surprised when I was asked to do this. I do not research in either church history or the contemporary post-1960 period. I am certainly not an expert on the Anglican Church, and I want to make that clear from the onset. 
I suspect that one of the most interesting things about this webinar is that I, I think the experts are really in the audience. So you may be wondering, why am I here? Well, first of all, I'm an Anglican, and I could not say no to Shelley. Let, let, let me just get that clear. But seriously, a historian really does not just recite facts or listings of chronological events. A historian really looks at past trends and tries to contextualize them within the bigger picture to understand the development needs of our people, our institutions, and our country. So I hope to give you a sense of how the Anglican Church has contributed to national development and how this fits into the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Added to this, I come from an Anglican family on both sides, and I have a family and personal history of my own with the Anglican Church. I hope to draw on this to show what the church has meant to everyday people as they try to live out their own hopes and dreams. At the end of the discussion, I hope I would have added to your insight just a little bit about how the Anglican Church has touched us all on a personal level, on a community level, and at a national level. Time has shown us that just as emancipation was a process, so too is independence. In fact, developments in this watershed period of the 21st century has led to renewed calls for reparations. It has led to the Black Lives Matters movement, calls for removals of statues and monuments. And we have seen the start in equity that this pandemic has made visible. All this I see as a call for a rethink. This century may just be the one in which the emancipation and independence processes and monuments finally culminate in a positive, qualitative development shift in this region. The Anglican Church was a part of colonization, enslavement, emancipation, decolonization, and independence. It will also be an integral part of the next stage of our development. I describe the next phase of our development as the one in which we will finally complete the decolonizing process, one in which we will engage in a new phase of historicizing, and one in which we will finally make independence real, not just for groups, but for all our people. Let's fast forward to today, 2021. The Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago comprises 30 parishes and one district. The Anglican Church is also being guided by a strategic plan which stands on seven important pillars. Leadership development, Christian education, utilization of physical and human resources, youth empowerment, management of finance, the process of reconciliation and social development. But how did we get here? Let's examine the change in context. And I want to go back, I want to go back before 1962 so that we can fully understand. Let's go back to the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, we see Trinidad and Tobago as a country that is still burdened with visible legacies of enslavement and indentorship, even though those systems have officially ended. In fact, as much as 100 years after emancipation, it was a legitimate question to ask what had really changed for the average working person. In fact, the working class in the entire region were moved to demand better throughout the 1930s. The country was grappling with the decolonizing process and we still have unfinished business in 2021. Nation building was complicated by colonial status that skewed our development plans. We were also dealing with a local church that was also in transition in many senses. I suggest that the church was to some extent going through its own version of ecclesiastical decolonizing and was redefining its own self and its mission. 
what would be the structure and status of the established church in this change context? In this period, I use the analogy of the Anglican church as a vehicle, a vehicle for progress. And I paint an image of the church as reaching out to society, a society that is very much in need. It had actually begun in the 19th century when the Anglican church became the established church in 1844. In 1872, the Anglican church became an independent diocese and Tobago joined in 1891. By 1930, we have the incorporation of trustees of the Church of England in Trinidad and Tobago. As these formal legal changes take place between 1848 and 1960, we see the Anglican Church extend its core from the center of Port of Spain to focus on outreach, especially in rural communities. This is an extremely active period for the church. The Daily Meal Society and Friendly Societies were established. In 1857, the St. Mary's Orphanage and of course the St. Mary's Parish. With the help of the government, there was the St. Michael's School for Boys. In the early 20th century, we see a, a period of church construction and school construction. Hostels were established. A lot of work was done with the underprivileged. In 1848, the search established an association to aid the deaf. In 1953, focus was based on providing special education to those with challenges. I would argue that in this period, the Anglican Church won, won the hearts of the people at a very critical stage in our history. For many, it was the vehicle for a changed life for them and for their children. As the official church active on the ground, it became the means to legit legitimization and respectability. Many parents who were not Anglicans christened their children in the Anglican church. I am the child of parents who my grandparents ensured were christened as Anglicans, even though they were not themselves Anglican. Church groups were integral parts of social and community development. Youth groups had a major influence over the development of young people. And I can't help but remember my father and his brothers. The church and the community were intimately connected. Thus, even before independence, the Anglican church as the official church of the state played an important role in communities that were developing. We see the church playing a central role in community cohesion. This was an extremely important role in an increasingly multicultural and multi-religious society. In this sense, I describe the Anglican church as contributing to who we are today as both agents of change and as a stabilizing force in a very critical period. The next landmark was independence. As I approach the topic of independence, I want to remind us, and I always do this, that we are new young nations and we are still very much finding our way. In 1962, we were full of promise and hope. Just as we were new nations, not from the perspective of rediscovery, but from the point that we had only recently seized the ability to chart our own course, so too, in many senses, we must understand that the church was young in Trinidad and Tobago, even though the Anglican church had deep historic roots and maintained its close connection with the Church of England. I suggest that in spite of its long presence in Trinidad and Tobago, the Anglican church had to grapple with several issues at independence. Political independence included not just economic, and political challenges, but also the search for our own national and cultural identity. It also called for a revised sense of social responsibilities. These were also factors which a church would have to confront. There must have been feelings about the relative autonomy and independence of the church and discussions 
about possible changes in areas such as structure and financing. In other words, after years in the region, the Anglican Church with independence in 1962 must have been deliberating about what would be its own identity in a newly independent Trinidad and Tobago. Where would it place emphasis? What would its own framework of theological and theorizing look like? What will be the Anglican Church's own brand of cultural expression? How will the church integrate itself into this newly independent Trinidad and Tobago? Doctrine is at the foundation of the church. However, it is local reality that determines the specifics of what the local church feels called to do in any particular historical period in any country. The end of the colonial era and the coming of independence brought radical changes. We were keenly aware of what underdevelopment theorists had said and the need for our young, relatively poor nations to succeed at independent status. How could the church support this development? The Anglican church responded with a very loud voice. There were three primary considerations. How would the doctrine of the church and independence differ from that in the colonial period? Would there be changes in the organizational structure of the church? What will be the institutions used by the church in the secular sphere? The church focused on its own brand of evangelization, education, and social action. Out of this, we see evolving what I would describe as the indigenization of dimensions of the church. Just as we in the academic world welcomed our own brand of what we call the creolization of West Indian history and started to create our own intellectual thought from the, 17, from the 1970s, so too, I suggest we see the Anglican Church making its own responses to this changed context. In 1966, the Church of England in Trinidad and Tobago became the Anglican Church of the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. Words are important. In the 1970s, the church welcomed its first native bishop, Clive Abdullah. We see steel drums being introduced into the liturgy. Pension schemes are introduced. The Anglican Center was created in 1972. There was a fresh look at the lay ministry with the emphasis being placed on specialized training. There was a focus on youth with the setting up of the youth council with a representative at the synod. The church pioneered legal aid programs. There was even more development in the education sphere. There was a diploma course in the theological studies. Parish churchship programs advanced membership. There were programs of Christian education for school teachers. There was a lot of partnering with the state and this became firmly entrenched. The state focused on economic development and at times partnered with the church because this was the vehicle for more effective implementation in very strategic areas. This led to the establishment of numerous institutions closely connected to the church. These included many schools and hospitals. I have not located the details, but I suspect the church must have found itself obliged to find more independent funds because of the changes that had taken place and the increasing separation between the church and the state. The church was now inserting itself in a fast changing world with a fast evolving distinctive culture. We observe a more open church in dynamic dialogue with the people, a more mature church which actively engaged community churches the laity stand out more and more. They are very impactful representatives of the church. Partnerships with key groups and institutions, expansion of the formal education sector. Education is closely connected to moral sensitivities. Their efforts to combat poverty and grassroots activities 
in communities thrive. By the time we get to the 21st century, we can see the contributions of the Anglican Church throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Not only were most of the 19th and 20th century establishment preserves, which, which is a very important thing. Many of them were preserved, but many were added. We now have the Mother's Union Children's Home. There are 37 schools run by the Anglican Board, a range of real estate and special facilities, important community vehicles, like the Disaster Preparedness Unit, the Community Engagement Response Team, the Board of Social Responsibility. There's grassroots community engagement, house to house visitation, pastoral care, college prayer meetings, care for the elderly, the, modern, the Mother's Union Network tribes, and there are a variety of programs too numerous to mention here. I do not mean to suggest that there were not challenges. I'll just talk about two. It is only in 1995 that the province of the West Indies agreed to the ordination of women. In 1996, the first women were ordained in our region. In our diocese in Trinidad and Tobago, the first two women were ordained in 1997. By 2011, there were 10 women ordained. And of course, to be, we have our dean. There has also been a decline in congregation. Anglicanism was the third largest religion in Trinidad and Tobago at independence. And growth continued up to the 1980s. But then it seemed to have peaked. And the decline continues. Recent activities making the news suggest that the church may once again be in an important transition phase. The focus of the strategic pillars supports this conclusion. Our recent challenges, the pandemic, the need to tackle the inequity that has persisted since independence, and what I call contemporary calls for new signifiers, all of this has led to responses from the church. It seems to me that the Anglican Church has always been its best when two things happen. When it responds thoughtfully and directly to the needs of the contemporary society, both at the grassroots level and at the level of establishing the social institutions which the current society needs. I leave you to determine the kind of bridge needed for the realities of the 21st century. I end with these recent images, which suggest that the foundations of this bridge are in good hands. I just want to share my screen. There's some of your own images, but I think they address things we really simply have to address today. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cato. Such an excellent presentation. I believe that we have a musical interlude before I make my response. Sharon Wynn? Yes, I'm here. 
Come, come away, hail to the day. This is our land's great morning. Birds in the trees waft to the breeze songs of our nation's dawning. Hummingbird bright, lend your delight. I miss your scarlet feathers. Kiss could he call, summon them all. This is a day of wonders. Oh, land of fairest beauty, we pledge our lives to duty and vow this day. And vow this day, and vow this day to serve thee. Flamboyant gay, make glad the day, colorful blooms resplendent. Ibiscus hedge, witness our pledge, and honor this day transcendent. Fireflies bright, shine through the night. Illuming our thanksgiving of this great day, each heart can say, This is our nation's dawning. Oh, land of fairest beauty, we pledge our lives to duty and vow this day, and vow this day. And vow this day to serve thee. Three sister hills list to the thrills, echoing to high heaven. And from the sea, the blue Caribbean breezes will join the revel. Palm trees on high reach to the sky, while bells are locked appealing man bird and beast earth sky and sea raise chants of joy excelling oh land of fairest beauty we pledge our lives to duty and vow this day and vow this day and vow this day to serve thee and vow this day to serve thee thank you very much Sharon Wynn beautiful song you have a beautiful voice very beautiful voice so, Dr. Cato, you said a great number of things, a great number of things. And looking here, um, the official separation of the church and state began in 1870, you said that. And it still continues today. And I can agree with that. The church, also the church is focused on our own brand of education, our own brand of evangelization, uh, making its own context in indigenization, use of steel drums, use of creating an Anglican center, pioneering legal programs, parish stewardship, partnering with the state, establishing numerous institutions between church and state. Or, we had so much to do with colonization and still doing work on decolonization. So my question is, what are we leaving for young people? How are we going to chronicle all of this good work? Because we as you know, young people say today, they are looking for somebody who is consistent. They're looking, they're looking for consistency and definitely the church has been consistent consistent on every level, from the political straight down to the grassroots, right? We have walked the walk, we have talked the talk, we have come up with the times, and yet still, how are we going to chronicle this? How are we going to keep it together? Well, yeah. first of all, Jeanette, in terms of chronicling it, you're simply going to write that book. 
and 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 get that done because 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 I think the history has to be preserved in a readable form, yeah. Um, but but I I I just want to say that um, there is a lot to be done, you know. Not because a lot has been done do we sit down and say a lot has been done. When when I um, started to try and do some research very quickly, it 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 what struck me is a lot of what we see now really started long before. And I found myself going back to the 19th century for the roots, yeah? And, and maybe we are tapped out ourselves, what roots do we want to lay down in 2021? Yeah? And we examine what do we need to anchor our society in 2021? Um, so, so I'm seeing several things. I'm saying I want you to do that book, and I think the the, the chronicling has to be. I've been bothering her about this for years. That, that that has to be done. But I want to say that we also have to do it in other forms too. We have to remember the, the generation that we have, yeah. And 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 just as we have we in class and in lectures, how we have to find new ways to excite and and involve. We 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 have to do that because I do think, to be honest, when when, when I think back to my parents and and um their experience in church really it was so dynamic and they, and it, it really gave them a foundation and 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 that is because what was doing what was being done then really catered to their generation and and i think we do have to do some soul searching and 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 i think we can't just keep on um on based on what was that foundation that was raised that came out of a critical response to society with certain needs. And I think now we have a society with other needs and I think the Anglican church must respond again. And 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 um, so that, that's my two pronged answer. I, I, I don't think it's that we've done everything. I think we've done a lot and a lot that we've done dates back to the 19th and 20th century. And let me say that, that, that I do think we, we have moved in, in, in terms of pluralization and indigenization, but I still think we have a lot to go, yeah? yeah. Um, which is why I made the point that we are young nations and we are still finding our way. And I think this is that century in which we will really realize that we need our own signifiers and be proud about doing it. And, and I hope I see the Anglican Church doing that too. All right, thank you very much. Um, any questions? I know there are some activists and some real historians in the audience as well. So if you have any other questions. No questions? You've said everything? See one? Going once, going twice. Great. Good afternoon, <laughs> thank um, you. Ms. Dukes. Um, thank you for your lecture, Dr. Katu. Sorry, I missed the first half of it. I am Dr. Stanley Griffin, um, Deputy Dean in the Humanities here at Mona, and we were having our graduate faculty orientation, so I had to split myself. I, um, so my apologies if I missed this question. I was wondering how the Anglican Church responded to the cultural di diversity and racial diversity that would have developed, well, it was developing in colonial times, but as an independent nation, how did the church respond or is responding to this diversity that perhaps the church never really had to encounter or face head on as part of the colonial structure? Thank you. I, I, I think in terms of um, dealing with diversity, I, I really think the church played a role in, in, in what I call community cohesion. And, and um, what I am seeing is the involvement in terms of the grassroots in communities did a lot to facilitate cohesion. And, 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 and therefore, when you look at the groups within the churches, for example, there is where you really see, see integration in, in terms of all the different groups and in, in, in terms of a common cultural expression. So I, I, I am not saying that more could not have been done, perhaps in, 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 in terms of being more vocal, but I think the actions of the church, especially within communities, played a very important part in, in, in creating cohesion within societies as we became more and more diverse in terms of our cultural experiences in Trinidad and Tobago. And I think the church has embraced 
um, um, the variety of, of cultural experiences. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. I think he's saying cohesion is interesting. So what about, you know, everybody's talking about COVID and when COVID is over, but how do you see the church, you know, from a historian's perspective, how do you see the church in a post-COVID world? And what, because I've seen that the church together with the Catholic church, they were given out vaccines. So where do you think, or efforts lie after or in this post-COVID world, so to speak? Well, I think they're going to be the, um, they're going to be two dimensions, the post-COVID world. I, I, I like Time Magazine. Um, it's not a restart, it's a rethink. Yeah. And I think the, the church also has to do a rethink as most major institutions have to do after COVID. I, I, I think it just has shown us the urgency of a rethink. So that's that, that, that's one level. On a practical level, though, I think that, um, as I said before, I think the Anglican Church is best when it responds directly to the needs of the society at that time. And I think COVID is going to create another set of needs. And, and I think the church should position itself to deal with some of those needs. We have to face it. We have a group of people not being educated. It's not happening because they don't have access to the online modes. We will not, I'm not blaming the ministry or anything. It, 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 it's, it's, it's just, we're doing the best we can. We have some lost people out there and, and, and I think we have to target them and find them in crucial ways. So reading programs in communities may be something we may want to think about post COVID, but, but an attempt has to be, has to be, have to have an attempt to find those people and the church may be better placed to do that than a ministry, you know, or, 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 or something like that. So I think outreach in critical areas is going to be important also after COVID. So, so I, I, I see it on two levels. All right. Thanks, Dr. Kito. I'm seeing Clayton Clark. I'm seeing your hand up. Yes. Uh, yes. Hear me? yes, we're hearing you loud and clear. Yes, good afternoon. Two questions. Um, well, you know, since Black Lives Matter, a lot of what has gone in the past, either coming to the fore or taking a different perspective. From the point of view of the church during the sl slavery um, period, um, you know, what was the church's position, I mean, in terms of slavery and, as I said, things are now one of the things I'm trying to ask the question maybe before something bursts up. up, up. What, what was the church position on slavery or involved or was it perceived to have condoned, supported? That's my first question. And the second one, you mentioned a drop in membership in the 80s. Not, well, you didn't, uh, right, there was a drop in membership. Any sort of study or uh, done to probably determine why, you know, why any sort of, are you aware of any kind of research to pick up on that drop of, uh, membership from a from a study point of view. I know the ministers have their work to do to um, evangelize and win souls, but you know, from a research point of view. When I when I made my two confessions, I, I was really confessing. I I have not done research on it. Um, um I I have um need to do that. I did secondary research. I pulled together um sources, and they all seem to be saying that the peak was in nineteen eighties. Huh? So post post nineteen eighties is 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 when they say there's decline and it, it it hasn't come back up. Um, so I can't give any statistics. Um, um, there was a I think in the in the eighties they were seeing membership increase by as much as forty percent. Yeah, but from the nineties there, there there seems to be a problem. Um, but but I have not done work in the area. Um, in terms of enslavement and the Anglican Church, it's a difficult one. Um, I think a lot of institutions will have to grapple with it. And yes, I think it's part of that rethinking um, um, that we will do in this century. Um, the Anglican Church was involved in enslavement. It was the, um, it was the established church. And, and um, that is a reality. Um, I 
my own work is in is in enslavement and, and i i do remember going to lambert palace in london and and reading the plantation records and and and, and trying to distinguish the difference between the, the, the church records and other records um so it, 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 it it's a reality that we have to deal with but 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 i think it's a stage of maturity that we we all um have to accept and understand um, once you have something like that in a society, for it to persist for so long, it means the institutions of the society are also supporting it for several reasons. And, 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 and it, 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 it is something that we must understand and we must deal with. Um, that, that's how we grow. That's how we mature. That's how we make sure that certain things are not done again. So I think that process in itself will be rewarding. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think by now we should realize that life is complex and it is not all a black or white picture. Um, um, the, 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 the reality is with emancipation, when everybody expected riot, most enslaved people found themselves in church. Yeah, and, and, and so, so, so we, we have to remember that. We also have to look at what we see the church doing in that post-1838 period, which I think is so important, um, going into uh, um, communities in, in a time of need. And, and we see the church also changing at, um, in terms of its approach. So it's, 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 it's complex, but, but I really think we, we, we like things to be too black and white and it never is. Yeah, and, and I think when we face things, when we confront, when we say what we have to say, and, and maybe it's not even confront, because I, I find sometimes so we approach things with too much anger. What we have to say, we want to understand the circumstances that led to this. And that is how we grow. And that is how societies evolve and don't make the same kinds of mistakes. So it's a matter of understanding the context and, 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 and how that shaped the church. Yeah, I want to add to that, that, you know, it's not because you're a slave owner, you don't have a special divinity or you don't have religious affiliation. Because if you look at a lot of the songs that used to be in the ancient and modern or the English hymnal, a lot of these people who were slave owners, a lot of them were slave owners. And it doesn't mean that you didn't have that type of divinity within you. But amazing grace is written, but amazing yes. grace is written by a slave trader. <laughs> and that is it. It doesn't mean that you don't have that type of divinity. Perhaps, as you said, it's more complicated than that, that there is a separation between work and church. Yeah, so I'm seeing here, Gail Young is saying, so to approach the past enslavement involvement then, a sort of truth and reconciliation should be done. And I agree with that. Yes, it should. It should have some yes, sort I, of- Yes, I, I think it should. And, and I don't think we approach the past from a point of superiority. You know, mm. I, I, I think a lot of us do, do, do that. I do wonder, and this may seem ridiculous, um, but I do wonder, Heather, if you were a white plantation owner, would you have done different? You know, and, and I hope I would have, and it makes me think of myself today. And, and, and it makes me be very careful, you know? So, 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 so I think our whole approach to the issue too is it, 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 it's very important. We see things sometimes that could really um, um, make us angry. And, but I think sometimes we approach it from a point of superiority and we shouldn't. We shouldn't, we, 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 we should approach it trying to understand it. We don't hide from it. And, and, and what it does do, I think it, it empowers us in a way to be ourselves. Because I keep saying we have a lot of decolonizing to do all over Trinidad and Tobago. So when we understand those realities, it will allow us to do some of the things. It will be that push to do some of the things we need to do. Right. I agree with that. But bringing it back to independence, I think we have a lot of work between enslavement to get to the point of independence. We could, you know about Mali and he said emancipation and emancipate yeah, self from mental slavery. But what is really the mental slavery? What is 
What are we looking at? Where are we? Where do we want to go? You know, you have to look at the past to go forward. But where are we going when we, we reconcile all of this? Where, where do we want to go? How far do we want to go? So you're looking at so many different things. And to get to a further point would take a lot more work. Now, I'm seeing a hand, but I'm not. OK, Trevor Allen. Yes, so you could go ahead. I'm seeing your hand up. Was that a mistake? Uh, that was, well, I, 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 I know I had my, my hand up. Um, Cedric Jofiel is my name. Oh, from okay. Trinity Cathedral. Yes, sir. Um, well, so I like to say um, that was a beautiful presentation on, on our history. I'm, I'm a lot more. Well, No, Why does the DJ, sorry? We're not here, and you clearly. I travel over the 59 years as, as um, um, 59 years as we grew as a people in a community, um, Trinidad and. The big so knowing that education, was a big aspect of our outreach in the grassroots community and, and you know on a broader basis where we now have colleges and um, primary schools. How is it that the Anglican community didn't go beyond that to expand knowing that education is the key to you know um, freedom of this, um, from sleep? How is it that we never venture to having that university, not just for academics and or that school space for the other types of education, being the trade craft and that kind of stuff. Is, is, do we have any insight as to how can we never venture along that path? And do we see it as important going forward in contributing to our national community? That's basically my question. All right. This this is what I would I would say to that. Um, I do think it is because we are uh, the official state church that that modus was not there to go further. I, I I think if we weren't the official state church, there there may have been a feeling that okay we need to have a. Uh, um, um, an, an Anglican University or something like that. But because theoretically, we are the official state, these state institutions, yeah, um, I, I think that is what prevented that from happening. But let me say too that on a practical side, it takes a lot in terms of financial resources and human resources to develop these institutions of, 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 of quality. So, so I, I, I do think that it, it, is, it is not an easy thing. I think the Anglican Church has done a lot in terms of education and high quality education up to the secondary school level. I think moving on to the tertiary level would take a lot in terms of, um, in terms of money, in terms of human resources. Um, and, 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 and I think the enterprise becomes more complex at that level. But I also think that, that, that when we see that development is usually among religious groups who think they have cultural norms which the established institutions may not allow you know in terms of dress in terms of practices and things like that so there's a need to form your own to keep up those social and cultural norms i think because the anglican church was is also the the the, the official church there was not that conflict between that culture and tertiary you um um areas of education. And I think that combined with the obvious economic and financial challenges there would have been is what's led to that. <coughs> I'm, I'm not sure that is the direction to go in either. But I, I, I may have my own biases. All right, so I have two questions, comments. This one from, or three. This one from Hedy, I'm sorry if I, mispronounced your name. I'm wondering if, sorry, not that. Yeah, I'm wondering if the focus 
on community cohesion was the church's approach to offering some level of healing as with the truth and reconciliation. One from Wendy Commoner York, we explored the role of the church in slavery in the last session in discussion with Dr. Pemberton. So it is not that it was ignored at all. And Michael Clark, we are not the established state church. The church lost that status long before independence. And I would like just to say, although we lost that status on paper, in practice, a lot of things still happen at the Anglican Church. And it is still seen as the state church, if not on paper through laws, through practice. All right, I will take a step of that. I, I, I agree. Now, I mean, I, I don't know if I remember all. In terms of the last one, I agree. Technically, we're not the established church, but we do still very much function as the official church. But the point I was really um, want to make it, 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 it is that usually when we see these things happening, it's, it's a conflict in terms of, of, of customs and culture that leads a group to think they need to set up an, an independent um, um, unit. With respect to, to slavery, I, I wasn't implying that it was ignored at all. Um, I knew Rita was coming and I knew she was coming to do the lecture. Um, so um, I, I'm, I was just talking in the general context to say that we it, it, it is not something we can ignore. Um, so I'm not implying that at all. And the, the there was one more, Janelle. Well, I think it was the truth and reconciliation. What? It's interesting to be to be honest. I was surprised to see um, all that development in the nineteenth century. I don't think. Uh, um, yes, we can look back and at now and 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 say maybe this was what was going on. But I I I I believe that the church in itself was changing. I believe that the church was going more into rural areas, and I believe that the church was dealing directly with the reality that um, they, 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 they saw in front of them. And that may have led to that kind of interaction. I can't say, I have not looked at the documents or anything like that, um, but, 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 but certainly it's amazing how um, the, the reality on the ground in a society creates the atmosphere for what kind of healing is needed at the time. So while I don't think there was formally any concept of, of, of anything like, like truth and reconciliation at that time, I do think the dynamics on the ground in the 19, um, um, 1930s created that environment in which the church realized that, listen, this is the need in the society was tough. Everything was bad in the 1930s. Economic, it, it, it was a, a, a reality. And I think the church responded to that by growing on the ground and extending themselves into, into in communities. And, and, and I think people appreciated that. I, I will just leave it at that. To say more, I would really have to get to the documents, hear what people said, see what the newspaper said, and, and things like that. So I wouldn't want to, to go that far at this point. But certainly there are parallels. OK, I think Wendy, she said, apologies, doctor. That comment was not meant for you. As a follow-up <laughs> to a question that was asked, as some may have missed that highly sensitive session. But no, I think it was, it was timely to ask it here. So. I don't think I made a mistake when it was good. So I have time for, for two questions or comments or concerns. I made something once more, um, <laughs> please forgive. Um, and I know you're focusing on Trinidad Dean too, but to what extent is the Trinidadian Anglican Church any different from the other Anglican churches of the Caribbean. Um, so, you know, without giving too much detail, I've grown interested in the last few years in the variety of Anglican worship um, expressions. Where, you know, when and thanks to YouTube, I am now able to worship various ways Anglican style. And so, what what caught my what is interesting to me is Jamaica has 
indigenized in some way with rhythms and so forth. They, um, they call it, the, there's a particular word they use, the something mass in terms of its liturgy. Well, mm. it still remains quite formal. And then the Bahamas is this high church. And then there's Trinidad, which I have noticed with pan and drum and so forth. So what's, you know, how different, how unique are the various Anglican churches of the Caribbean in this one province? It's, it's all very interesting. I simply do not know. I, 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 I really do not know. That, that, that is interesting. Um, what, what I will say though is that I find, I, I find in Trinidad, the, 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 it really changes according to the community um, in, 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 in terms of the Anglican church. I get different experiences according to where I am and the extent to which you know, you're using the drums and the, 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 the pan and, and, and things like that. And some of the services are, 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 are far more conservative, but I really can't say for the um, Anglican church regionally. I, 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 I don't know. But what I would say is this, um, having been to the Anglican church in, in, in um, England when I was there, it's amazing that there is a there is a I don't know what to call it. There, there, there's a sense of, of, of continuity with the Anglican Church even up to up to today. You know, so there's there's a sense of comfort, if I want to call it comfort, because you 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 you, 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 you see you see the parallels and you feel like hold hold on yes I am part of this big Anglican family. And, 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 and I think that is there. But I, I do think, and, and let me say this carefully, I do think the, the, the Anglican Church in Trinidad, I do want to talk about the Caribbean. I think we, we still have a way to go in developing our own stamp on, 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 on the Anglican Church. I, 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 I still think we, 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 we have a way to go in terms of that, and I will leave it and that for now. All right. Yes, yes, yeah, see somebody talking about the Jamaica reggae mass, and I've heard about yes. it. <laughs> I, 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 I have heard about it. I was in Jamaica once, and, and, and I think it was at Emancipation, and, 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 and people were talking about this reggae mass that was so fantastic. I don't know if we have anything equivalent in, in, in Trinidad. I, I still think we have a way to go. All right, Holy Trinity, I think this will be the last comment. Holy Trinity says, on a scale of one to 10, what evidence do you see of Trinidad and Tobago in our churches, which would be an indication of our independence? On a scale of one to 10, what do I see about Trinidad in our churches, which will be an indicator? Of independence. How, how, how should I tell them? You asked me on, on a scale of one to 10. Um, and when, when we say independence, I'm going to take independence to be our own brand. Yeah. Um, um, within the general Anglican church and, 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 and a sense that I am in a, 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 a Trinidad church or to be good church as, a, as opposed to a, a, another church. Um, I, I think in terms of that, we have some way to go. Um, again, in my experience, it varies according, according to where you go. But I would, I would put, I would say six, honestly, I, I, I would, would, would say six. Um, I, I think we have a, a ways to go in terms of that. All right, so any other questions, comments, queries? So we could successfully end this part of the session. Question and answer. I think Mr. Allen had a question. Okay, uh, Mr. Allen. Okay, so while we're waiting on Mr. Allen, he just un he just okay. unmuted. Okay. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes. I'm all hearing yeah. you. I don't know if it was answered in the questions that you, you posed and your responses, but my question at that time was that um, you spoke about we are still in a process of decolonization. 
I, I think I, I got you said that. Mm -hmm. And my, my thinking is that um, it's, it's a process of trying to find your identity. And um, how do you see us reaching to a point where that it will affect our responses, not only in worship, but even in our spirituality as such. And I was looking at that in the context of, we talk about the declining um, participants, parishioners um, in the church. And I was looking at the, at the youth and where the youth and if they could be comfortable in their identity um, when they come to, to, to the church and participate in its activities. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm making every understanding clearly, but um, I'm talking about forging identity so you could know a Trinidad and Tobago person. A Trinidad and Tobago, because of, I know we have a, several things we talk about our characteristics, the happy go luck, we did this with that in mm -hmm. particular. But I'm just talking about a kind of a rounded, identifiable, um, that will reflect in all that we do. And as we are talking church here, I'm talking about in our, even in our spiritual, not only the drums and the, and the bells and the singing, but in, in, a, in, a, in a worship, in a, in developing a spiritual within that context, that it's us of a Trinidad and Tobago person. Yeah, I, I think you've captured it well. Um, a lot has to do with we as a people. And, 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 and maturity of a people and understanding self. In terms of, 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 of how do we get there? I think this is an excellent start. Um, I, 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 I think in, 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 in our communities and our, um, with our churches, if, 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 if we understand why that church is there, how that church has gotten to be there, you know, the, the, the role that church has played in the, in, in the development of the community. I, I, I think things like that are very important. I think we have to not be afraid to, 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 to look about the, 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 the bad and the negative and to understand how that has shaped us. And, and, and I, I, I think we also need to be proud of the positives. And, and, but, 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 but I think we have to find a way, and this is not just in the church, in our society in general, to discuss things in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a progressive environment and agree that this is what we need to do in terms of the next step. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think if we acknowledge and understand that we want more of this, we want more of our Caribbean identity, you know, and, this is, and, and, and we understand how we've got to this point, I think we can outline that with three simple areas. Yeah, that we think that if we work on this as a church, we will be able to be we will be taking a step in the right direction. And 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 and, and I think it's 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 um it's 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 it's, it, it's going to grow from that. Let me say that I we are talking about the Anglican Church, but I really think we've reached a stage in our development where that has to be done in almost all of our groups in the education sector. So it's not just the church that has to de 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 um, de 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 colonize. You could do all you want and then you go to school and you're still using language you, 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 you shouldn't be using and getting distorted pictures of history and, and things like that. So as a nation, we have to tell ourselves, we're going to 60, we put it on some big boy or girl clothes mm -hmm. and we need to start to deal with some of the issues that we need to deal with. We need to understand, however, that we have come a long way. And sometimes I, I think, you know, we, we could be a bit harsh on ourselves. We've come a long way and we acknowledge that. And as mature people, we say, listen, these are the areas that we have to work on for the next stage and let's start to take some steps towards those areas. And, and um, that is the, is the process which I hope we see coming out. Of, of, of all this protest and, and all of it. I think it's a society saying, listen, it's time for a rethink, it's time for a change. And I think the church, as with all the other processes, will be part of that rethinking and changing. That doesn't mean that a lot has not been done and a lot of positives has not, have not come out. Thank you, Dr. Kato. So I have 
one question and one comment to end this segment. Gail Young says, agreed. We have much to do to put our TT stamp on our worship service. And Clayton Clark asks, and I think you would have answered this in part, do you see we have used our culture or infusing our culture sufficiently in our church? We could do more. We, we, yeah, I, I, I think we can do more. I, I, I really think we can. There's no other way, there, 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 there's no other way to see it. I, I think we can do more. I agree. So thank you very much, Dr. Kato, for all your insights, for your presentation. And I want to thank all the people who asked questions, sent comments. Thank you very much. So I will now turn you over to our next item, which is a musical interlude. Judith? God bless a nation of many varied races. May we possess that common love that binds and makes us one. Let it be known around the world that we can boast of unity and take our pride in our liberty. God bless our eyes of tropic beauty, of flaming points, and shady immortal. The warm and sparkling waters that beat upon our shore beat out for two that seems to tell we take our pride in our liberty. God bless our leaders, give them grace to guide, bestow on them thy judgment wise, to rule the land all right, to keep the flag of freedom high that we may sing most lustily we take our pride in our liberty we take our Thank you. Apologies for my dogs. And we come to that 
time when we show our gratefulness for those who have sacrificed their time and have delivered such stirring messages to us. So can we have at this time the vote of dance? Good afternoon again, everyone. My humblest apologies for my pets in the background and the distraction that they would have caused. <laughs> but I am very honored this evening to be given this task of the um, giving and sharing thanks, you know, saying thank you for, for all the persons who would have contributed in this um, delivery of this session, webinar, whatever you want to call it, you know. But we want to first thank, you know, start off by saying thank God. We want to thank God for life and the opportunity, you know, for this event to take place. We want to thank God for the partner, the partnering of the Trinity um, Cathedral and Holy Savior Church that really had the idea to put together this session this afternoon to bring the information about our Anglican church and the contribution it has made to the development of our people in Trinidad and Tobago. And the information we shared here this afternoon, I am certain that it is going to provoke a lot of thought from persons. We know for sure some persons will be looking to get additional information. So that person who would have asked a question about the role of the Anglican church in, the, in, in, in slavery, you know, that kind of information and events like this and webinars like this can actually bring that kind of information to the people. And that is what this is all about, sharing and teaching, you know, because we have an obligation to our people and we understand how this is important and we expect that um, we do our part as Anglicans in the church to do what we have to do. And I, I just wanna thank um, all the persons who would have taken the time today to share this very special event with us. All the persons who would have participated um, in song, Miss Fraser, Miss Wynn, who would have done their vocals. And I want to thank our moderator, Miss um, Duke, you know, for taking charge of this whole uh, um, proceedings this evening and, and being charged with a responsibility, a humongous responsibility to start writing that book, Miss <laughs> Miss Duke, you know, by our our main speaker, by our main speaker, Dr. K2. And I, I, I just want to share something with you all because earlier in the week, I saw a post in the Anglican <laughs> Church chat, which spoke, which highlighted a book that was a publication of our history in the Anglican Church, the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago. 1872 to 1972, a hundred year span. And right away I thought, wow, are we going to wait until 2072 to do that second edition of the book of the Anglican Church? I think not, and I hope not. And I hope, Miss Duke, that you will actually take up the challenge. And I think this evening where um, our main speaker, Ms. Um, Dr. Cato would have covered that period 1962 to, to the present, 2021 is a good place to start. And I think it's important that we document all of our information in, in many formats, because we cater in for a variety of persons. And, 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 and the important thing is how we document, how we catalog, and how we make accessible so that the information wouldn't just be documented but it is important to also make these things accessible to all our Anglicans and people of in, in general in our country. And I wanna say a special thanks this evening to Dr. Kato for willingly uh, agree to um, take up the, this challenge to share on, on 
uh, on the topic on this topic this evening the the role of the anglican church and independence and nation building from 1962 to the present i am very happy that she took on this um challenge and and i'm really um appreciative of the fact that we have how many people here with us today who would have um joined to to really hear what's being offered you know and and to be able to share that information but the mantle the challenge is always sharing that information and we as in individuals and adults we have a, a responsibility of our own to share what we learn whether it's through stories through songs through writing literature we have to share what we know to the generation so we don't want to see in 2072 we're talking about a generation loss so thank you very much to everybody's and their contribution be really happy that we have 55 persons at this point in time who would have really um, taken the time to join us and to share with us. And we look forward to seeing all of you here again for the final series, because this is just number two of three. And we expect that we will have you all join us for the last series. But I would, at the end of this third series, I'm hopeful that we would be able to share some information to the participants and to our Anglican congregation as to how they can go about finding and accessing the documents of these sessions that we would have had, the recordings, or maybe um, reporting of these sessions so that we can make the information available to a wider audience. So thank you again, um, Rev. Um, allowing allowing this session to take place thank you everybody for participating thank you thank you thank you thank you judith and as we recognize that there are several persons without electricity at this time so we lift them up in prayer i got some messages saying that we cannot come on because i don't have electricity so we bear that in mind I guess that's why we didn't get to the 100 this to time. The 100 to the yes, but yes. there were about 60 persons on. Um, so I would hand over right now to the dean. Is the dean on? Is the dean on? No, she isn't. Uh, maybe Father Goss? Father Goss? Father Goss? Yes, I am here. In the absence of the Dean, can you do the give your closing remarks and, uh, and closing prayer? We really want to thank you all for partnering with us um, on this very important series. And we look forward to the third one where we would have the right river and uh, the right bishop. Lord Berkeley as our guest. Thank you. So, so thank you very much for this opportunity to be part of uh, this second uh, lecture to the moderator and to the guest lecturer or speaker. Thank you very much again for your insight and your knowledge in this aspect of the Anglican Church. And I, I must say that the last comment by Mr. Clark, definitely we need to put more emphasis on our own aspect of bringing our church into the more Caribbean aspect. So thank you very much. Yes, and I must say, if I can add just to that, that I think an attempt was made many years ago at St. Clement Anglican Church where under the, the leadership of the late Canon Clive Griffith who brought in from 1996 to 2003, the Kwanzaa celebrations. And although it was a, a North American term and, and festival, he brought in a lot of indigenous aspects of our culture. And it was the first place I was privileged to see persons and their consciousness being raised to the point where they were actually every Sunday coming to church in their African outfits and other people in their indigenous outfits. So I think work has been done there, but much more is needed to continue. 
So, uh, but a clock, I, I think definitely, you know, that that's something we need to look at. So thanks again for this very informative and very thought provoking and timely um, lecture about the Anglican Church and its development of our nation from 1962 to 2021. Again, I think um, we need to write as a people. I think not much writing is being done. So that book has to come out and other writings, other papers, other, other, other things that once we get it, we research, we do it. And it is there for everyone to access because there's a lot of information that people need. And I think that is so important that we keep this as a posterity for the younger ones that are coming up so they can actually be part and parcel of this great institution that the Anglican Church is, especially in the Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago, because we are unique in that sense. So thanks again, Dr. Cato, and thanks again, uh, Janelle. Thank you very, very much. Yes. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for this evening once again. We thank you, Father, for what was said, what was shared. We thank you, dear God, for those who participated. And as we leave this forum, oh God, may you continue to give us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding that we need as we forge ahead as a people, dear God, as we forge ahead to new heights of doing your ecclesia your church, your heavenly father, as we forge ahead in the 21st century, knowing fully well that the church of the 19th and the 20th centuries will be different from this time because we are called to new challenges and different things. But clearly, heavenly father, you have given us a spirit of courage to be strong and also a spirit of reconciliation and a ministry. So we pray God that the church of the 21st century will look inwardly and outwardly there will be no insiders and outsiders, but there will be only your people. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, and may your wisdom continue to guide us. In no other name but the wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all for a very enlightening evening and do have a good night's rest. Remember to be safe, to watch your distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, and willingly take the vaccine so that we all can go back to church quickly and safely. So thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to Holy Trinity Cathedral and the Holy Savior Anglican Church. And thank you, Father Augustus, for leading us in prayer. <laughs>